Welcome to Lawmen, a podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm Alastair Beckett-King. And I'm James Shakeshaft. And in this episode, we're joined by comedian, podcaster and self-proclaimed beatnik Robin Ince. Yes! For a psychogeographical tour of... The Chilterns. The Chilterns. Which sounds like a sitcom. It could be a new one, The Chill Town. Oh, cool. The young people will enjoy that joke, James. What, the ones that don't listen? <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Shut up, they'll hear us. With their pin-sharp hearing that young people have. I broadcast this at the mosquito pitch to keep youths away <laughs> from my house. <laughs> it's the story of Grimm's Ditch. One of the Grimm's Ditches. There's more than one. Hello, James Shakeshaft. Oh, hi, Alistair Beckett King. I love the surprise in your voice there. I know. Very sort of um, afternoon special. Oh, hello there. Oh, oh, hello, Alistair Beckett King. You've come to see me in my shed. Yes. Do me a favour, James. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, stand up, walk out of the shed, and you should see a little grotto in front of you. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. I'd... OK, now just walk north into the grotto. Y- yes. OK, and on the floor you should see a knapsack in front of you. Oh. Have you got it? Yep. Yep, so... Uh, There's what I'll... appears to be an out-of-work actor dressed as a jester here. Shall I just ignore him? Yep, try not to be distracted by that. Um, and don't step on the blue tiles. OK. Inside the knapsack yep. you should find uh, an obsidian mirror. Can you see that? Um, I don't know what obsidian means. It's not important. It's, I... a black, it's a black volcanic rock. OK. Uh, what yep. happens is... I mean, I shouldn't have to go into this, James, but what happens is when... When magma cools very quickly, mm-hmm. the crystals don't have time to form. Go on. And so you get a very smooth glass-like rock. Right. Okay. So that's what obsidian is. And it's used in scrying mirrors and, and that sort of thing. I don't know what scrying is either. All right. Well, we, look, I'm just trying to introduce the guests and you're making it very difficult. Look into the m- mirror, James. I'm making it difficult. You've built a grotto in my garden <laughs> that contains yeah. an obsidian mirror. I, I've done my bit. That's crying. Obsidian. Obsidian. Look in, the, look in the mirror, James. Oh, it's like when your phone runs out of batteries. <laughs> there's, there's a guest law person in the mirror. Can, can you see the guest law person? Oh yeah, I'm making him out now. It's the fairest in the land. It's the incredibly patient Robin Ince who's remained <laughs> silent during all of that absolute piffle. Hello, Robin. Thank you for being a guest law person. W- what I loved about that was when you did that, knowing obviously that I'm overly verbose, uh, that the fact that you said we're doing an intro. Don't worry, it won't take long because you. Could already see. Oh God, is he going to be able to be bloody quiet for one minute and twelve seconds? I'm entirely uncertain whether that's possible. I'm in the mirror. Jump. <laughs> tap tap tap. I was worried you were going to jump in and correct my explanation of how obsidian forms. Oh to be no, honest. don't worry about that. I've got a man who does all my science for me, <laughs> so I, I let him do all that. I'm sure the geologists on Twitter will be all over me. Oh no, not geology Twitter. That's the worst kind. <laughs> we did a, a, an infinite monkey case. The Radio Four show I did. We, we did a uh, uh, one on geology and um, when the two geologists talked about the fact that sometimes you just chew on a rock to get a sense of what the rock is what the audience found it hilarious and they were going no 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 you really do there, there's a way i mean you don't chew hard i mean especially not if you're 52 like me they, you know i can't even have one of those little eclair toffees let alone <laughs> a piece of obsidian or anything else but it is uh, but but there's just a so you kind of just play with it in your, in your mouth and you will get a, a, a sense of what form of rock it is oh. it's, it's obviously 100 percent accurate but it will manage to narrow down mm. to some extent mm. if you're in a sort of a cat heavy area you find out that's that's not a rock. <laughs> oh, yeah, never. I mean, if you're actually buying cat litter and you want to know the quality of the cat litter, that's a, yeah, that's a disaster. Certainly not used cat litter. I, I think Gwyneth Paltrow recommends it for something or other. I think you're meant to pull warm cat litter up your bottom or something and it's maybe good for halitosis, I don't know. But if you are chewing cat litter, there's no better way of getting a sense of the absorbency. <laughs> This is low dusting. I think if mm. John Waters did the Home Shopping Channel, there would be a bit <laughs> where the ghost of Divine would appear. I just watched that. Uh, uh, the the Pink Flamingos. It's, oh, it's, no, I'm thinking of the... Um... The Shopping Channel? <laughs> the shopping <laughs> Channel. QVC, that's the one. I just uh, Very that. disturbing. <laughs> disturbing, outlandish, garish, but... Um, and expensive. It really challenged what I thought about a lot of things. Yeah, amazing. But I have a great pen. If anyone needs any cans <laughs> pierced, I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm confident that the listeners to our folklore podcast will be familiar with mm. your infinite monkey cage output. 
and the cosmic you are like the overlord of the cosmic shambles network yeah that is where i reign in my mystical land yeah which is uh, is so much i mean it's one of those things which i'm sure as you found as well during lockdown trying to just create things because if you don't create things we uh, that's all we are that's all we are, isn't it? We turn up to gigs or we, we make something, we film something stupid. It doesn't really matter. The audience are secondary, useful, should they wish to pay us. <laughs> but the main thing is that you, you I, I think it's a, an interesting division that you see in times like this of just how much some people creating is a very, very necessary part of their existence. It's not in any way uh, a, mm. a game plan for a job. Mm. It is... And, and I think it's it's an act of kind of trepanning, I always think, you know, which is, you know, e- even though I know trepanning probably actually wasn't about getting out of the bad thoughts, and there's a lot of new evidence about trepanning and what it actually... <laughs> but using the traditional sense that trepanning was, I will drill a hole in my head and all the devils are coming out. I think you're right. I think there's a sense in which we're all... We're, tr- we're trees in the woods looking around and going, well, there's nobody here, but I'm going to fall anyway, because <laughs> that's my thing. I might as well do it. I mean, that's what I love about the cosmic shambles. It's just, it's an excuse to have conversations with people who just have you know knowledge which is way beyond me and i think that's that's why i'm lucky about ending up doing stuff in science as well is i i you know to have on kind of quick dials and going i don't seem to understand black holes today and the idea that we might all merely be holograms <laughs> hang on a minute i've got someone's number in my phone i think they've studied that <laughs> which i guess is why we've come to you as the the metatron of all knowledge uh, the um <laughs> hmm, the cosmic shogger <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but you you grew up on the cusp of Hertfordshire and booking. I'm from the northeast of England, so all of these places are just meaningless, noddy towns to me. <laughs> um, where are you from, Robin? Well, it is. I mean, the, the thing that makes it easier is it is the kind of place where Midsummer Murders is filmed a lot. Yes. <laughs> so it, it's not far from, from Great Missenden, I think, which is, mm. uh, I think it's also where Roald Dahl had his house. I think it was it Great is. Missenden. There's a small yeah. museum there, I believe. Uh, so I'm not far from there. That was where I was born. Sometimes I've been touring. I remember being in Brisbane and turning on a TV at like 11 at night in the hotel and going, oh, that's where I was born because <laughs> it was a Midsummer Murders <laughs> <laughs> where there'd been some kind of rivalry over a herbaceous border that had led to, you know, yeah. uh, canny use of a scythe. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's just on that kind of border, just around the Chiltern Hills. Dirty Dozen was filmed here. The Dirty oh. Dozen? Yeah, The Dirty Dozen with Lee Marvin and Ernest Borg. And I have, uh, I possess some quite poor quality photos of the backs of their heads in a Jeep. Whoa. <laughs> Dirty Dozen was filmed before I was born, but apparently my sister, who would have been five, did have her picture taken with Lee Marvin, but no one knows where that picture is. That is one of the great... Oh. One of the great folkloric traditions of the Chiltern Hills area <laughs> is those who apparently met Lee Marvin, and yet mm. there is no evidence for it. It was said that Lee Marvin could be seen, but never the front of his face. Yeah. Only the back. <laughs> <laughs> whoever saw his face would die the very next day. What's that rumbling noise in the distance? Is it Marvin's Jeep? Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is the the home counties. So this, I suppose this is not that far from your area, is it, James? We're just the other side of the Chiltern Ridge where the rest of Midsummer Murders is shot. Tame, where the high street is the high street of Midsummer. Is there a big east side, west side rivalry? I don't know. We've definitely got a Midsummer walking tour, and I think you can see the area where Michelle McCutcheon was crushed by a cheese that time <laughs> <laughs> and let's be clear that is the plot and not a, a, a production accident yes that you're making light of yeah. there I, I don't do i need to explain what midsummer murders is in case uh non-british listeners aren't aware it's a worldwide phenomenon i genuinely can tell you from yeah. b- being someone who watches television at you know kind of midnight <laughs> in various different <laughs> places in the world eddie pepitone do you know eddie no oh, i know of eddie certainly w- wonderful uh american comic and i highly recommend uh um, if any, if anyone listening to this has not seen the documentary, The Bitter Buddha is a brilliant movie about about him and mm. very 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 funny um, comedian. And and he and his wife in LA they just sit and they watch British murder mysteries the whole time. Really? So while we feel the exotica of Columbo on <laughs> Channel Five, he feels the exotica <laughs> of uh, Lewis. Unfortunately, is is a no go area now, which is yeah. just I just can't watch it now because of that that silly man being silly. Mm. Uh, yeah, Kevin Whiteley. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, he seems like a decent guy. I think he is. I'm pretty certain. I've, I've, mm. I've met him a couple of times, and and uh, and he's all right. Yep. Waitley's all right. Yep. The balance of the universe, in fact, the all rightness of Waitley is so great due to the unall rightness. Yes. Um, and of course, neither of them could exist without the other. <laughs> no. Um, it's... D- it's like the dark crystal. <laughs> ah. Only one of them looks like mm. a grotesque puppet, so that's unfair to <laughs> Kevin Waitley. <laughs> 
I did do a little bit of, of folkloric research on this area. Do you know the river the Misborn? Yeah. It goes through Mizzenden. It's apparently at points the river goes underground yes. and then when it rises up and when it's when it's in flood, that's said to be a bad omen. According to Forgotten Folklore of the English Counties, which is collected by Ruth L. Tongue, and L is her middle initial. She's not um, like a Spanish wit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch to say that a flood is a bad omen. Like, like you could say that about any natural disaster, like an earthquake's happening. You're like, oh... Bad omen. It's like, no, it's you just a bad means. thing currently happening, isn't it? It tends to foretell houses falling down, <laughs> these earthquakes. This river has predicted the fire of London, the plague of London, the death of King Edward VII and the First World War. And this was reported in 1939 when the river was in flood oh. and the person to whom the thing was told rode home after a long day, stabled their tired pony, and the sirens began their first eerie warning wail for the first blitz. Mm. Yeah. It does say a lot, doesn't it, about that kind of patriarchal and reasonably, I suppose, oppressive society that existed, that the availability of water was seen as a curse <laughs> uh, rather than... Because as you said, it's not even flooding. It's literally, if the river can be seen, if water is available and therefore the market for water that is sold by your local lord is destroyed, mm. it's a bad omen. Mm. It's a bad omen for the markets. My understanding is that you know some some creepy stuff has happened in, in your... Well, down your manor. I mean, one of the things that's very beautiful here is the local manor house, which also, for fans of The Crown, doubled up as uh, Churchill's house Chartwell. Oh. There's a, a one of those... You know when you see an oak tree or, or a large tree mm. that you cannot believe it's still alive because so much of it... It's, it's this incredible hollow, so the whole of the centre is gone. It's a very... I, I would say it is probably... Uh, for, for an average adult human, it, it's probably about one and a half arm spans in terms of the, the, the girth wow. of the trunk. And that was apparently where... Uh, uh, when Queen Elizabeth first visited the manor house, she hid in uh, in that tree, and jewels oh. were hidden there. Oh. Um, or indeed, her jewels merely fell off. I heard that she lost her jewels. Within, Why was she hiding within that oak? That's it's. Do you know what? Back in the old days, there were a lot of oak trees. The Virgin <laughs> Queen. I'll tell you what. I don't know an oak tree where she didn't lose her jewels. <laughs> <laughs> For the listeners' benefit, you took a little sip of tea there after that one. Just uh... <laughs> black coffee, mate. I'm a beatnik. Okay. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> you don't read this much Kerouac and have tea at this time of day <laughs> but yes yeah, so, so it's got and, and also there are lots of things like the, there's a a, a a series of of what are kind of considered to be um passages where monks would have hidden during the reformation oh we love it we love a monk's tunnel i love a priest yeah. hole or a monk's tunnel or... yeah and they, they're great there's a there's a few of those though apparently my my, my dad sometimes that this manor house is now actually open to the public but it used to only be open on very special occasions if the sealed knot came for instance to reenact the battle of naseby or similar Ooh. And uh, the sealed knot, by the way, for because uh, I think that is though Midsummer Murders travels. Mm. I would imagine anyone listening in, uh, say, Idaho mm. will not know about the rich tradition of battle reenactment in uh, in the UK. Oh, I don't know. Oh, really? Uh, they they know about battle reenactments, but probably not that the tradition of reenacting civil wars. Yeah came from over here yeah well, i suppose mm. because they, they, they haven't yet reached the point where they're distant enough away from a civil war to actually start <laughs> reenacting it it does feel yeah. it's being lived it, it feels like in america there's a real risk that a reenactment of the civil war could just start a new civil <laughs> yeah. war at the moment and it's probably just not worth the trouble and we all enjoy costumes but come on just a bit of cosplay but my dad when he would sometimes be, be asked to volunteer to take people around these the the, the priest holes would explain that they were mainly actually sewage uh, some monks did have to hide there, but they weren't hiding in apparently purpose-built mm. priest holes. They were making use of the sanitary equipment that mm. could fit a man and his hessian. So there's a sort of a teleological error that we've assumed design in seeing a priest in a hole. We've assumed that the hole was made for the priest rather than that the priest <laughs> has simply made use of a pre-existing hole. <laughs> I'm glad I've done this, right, because I've never thought of it from a teleological perspective, but it's quite clear, you're right. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing. That's, and, and the house that I was brought up in was built on the site of an old inn, the Goat Inn. Mm. So when I was a kid, I would have the great excitement if you went digging in the garden, you'd find lots of bits of clay pipes, as I'm sure, I'm sure people have enjoyed oh, that, that oh, kind yes. of thing. So it's that. Th there's nothing, though, in terms of, apart from the fact that the Peter 
Cushing film Trial by Combat was made here, which is a Peter Cushing film which very few people have seen. Mm. Very similar to George A. Romero's Night Riders, which is a George A. Romero film that's very rarely seen. <laughs> um, it turns out that actual battle reenactment movies are not very popular. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've seen either. Have you seen Night Riders? I, I, have, I have not, James. If it's got nothing to do with the David Hasselhoff TV series, then no. No, Night, Night Rides is about... Ed Harris is in it, quite an early outing wow. for Ed Harris. And it's about a bunch of people, and as Tom Savini as well, the makeup artist for George A. Romero as well, who, who acted in, in stuff as well. And they go around from town to town doing kind of various things with lances and all of that stuff, uh, but on motorbikes. Oh. So they're kind of medieval knights, but on motorbikes in the 20th century. And Trial by Combat, the Peter Cushing movie, has a similar thing, but obviously without the motorbikes, because <laughs> British film industry did not have that kind of budget in 19. 19- 76. But if you want to see a guy on a tricycle with a lance, yeah. that's the film. <laughs> we haven't got a lance, but we have got a little bell. So what? So this fight scene is it's not so much a fight scene now, so you're just going around the circle here in this farmyard <laughs> ringing the bell. But, but at each other. Yeah. One of you has tinnitus. It's actually, there's a lot of jeopardy. There's a lot of jeopardy here. Mm. The manor house you mentioned, is that Cheney's Manor? Is that the name of it? Cheney's Manor House, yeah. You didn't say the name. You're not, are you trying to keep the village a secret? Would you rather I didn't broadcast the name? No, no, no. It's far too late for that now. I mean, it was. <laughs> okay. There used to be a mist around it, and we called it Luffville, which, of course, was an anagram for Ghoulville. And uh, I I will throw in any chance where I can use a reference to the Monster Club. Any of you seen the Monster Club? I don't think so. Right. I know this is not technically an, a, an obscure niche 1970s culture show, but I would like to apologise. <laughs> Anything I appear on will eventually become that. Uh, the Monster Club is the first film that I ever saw from the, a video rental shop. Ooh. It's uh, Vincent Price and John Carradine and James Lawrenson, who is a, a brilliant actor who's in it. Wait, I forgot. It. And it's about the club where the monsters hang oh. out. And Vincent Price tells three stories, three terrifying stories. Is one about the shad mark. Um, the shad mark, which whistles, has a very powerful whistle. Oh, I had a mate like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this one's not an annoying whistle. This is a whistle that kills. It's a very different thing. Which is oh. a, a little annoying. Yeah. <laughs> more than annoying to be killed by a whistle. Yeah, that's the thing. It's more than annoying. Mm. Yeah. There's a whistle that gets on your nerves. There's another that actually eats into and ultimately melts all your physical structure. I had a mate like that. Is that the tagline for the film? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you about a whistle. Are you sure this is going to sell? We'll have so the whistle on the poster and everything. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember what you asked me at the beginning of the show, and this has really not gone into any direction that's usable for you just wondered if you were recording <laughs> I, yeah no, I'll delete it now shall I yeah it's probably for the best isn't it um, I think eventually there's going to be a podcast I do where someone will finally go I've been listening can I diagnose you now can I <laughs> You're listening to What's Wrong with Robin Ince. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I asked you about Cheney's Manor. Oh, yeah, the Manor House, right? So, yeah. Cheney's yeah. Manor, or as I believe it used to be called, Cheney's Palace, which is quite exciting, even though there is no person called Cheney's because Cheney's is the name of the village. Uh, originally Eisenhamstead or Iron Homestead. Ooh. There we are. That's, uh, oh, and it has nice. a very beautiful church, St Michael's, which has the Bedford Chapel. So the Bedford family, the Russell family, who uh, Bertrand Russell, sadly, who's the Russell oh. member of the Russell family, I know, but was not buried here, but most of the Bedfords were, who are now at Woburn Abbey. And, and I believe that in the Bedford Chapel, one of the people who's buried there was beheaded <laughs> and then pardoned, and so their head was then sewn back on. In looking into Cheney's Manor, uh, I found a fantastic, Mm -hmm. book. So in the mid-1950s the Duke of Bedford, his family by then no longer lived in Cheney's Manor but they had and he was my, my understanding is that according to the book that the Duke himself was basically penniless. Now I don't know what, what the Duke version of being basically penniless is but there's a little sort of about the author thing where it tries to win your win you over to the Duke and it says how he had to go off to South Africa and become a fruit farmer because what could endear you more to a white British aristocrat than having been a farmer in apartheid South Africa what hardship he must have undergone but the the book itself I just I really like the cover so oh uh, yeah silver oh, plated spoon yeah both of these covers to a silver plated spoon which I hope we will be able to tweet out fill me with enormous delight yeah Especially the caption on on one of them, an enterprising young duke. I mean, if you look at the picture of him, young is a stretch. <laughs> and I think enterprising is also a stretch. Yeah, but you also know that young thing. You, you must sometimes watch talking pictures TV or something like that. Mm. And you see some actors who are all in their late 50s. And then you look them up on IMDb and go, wow, 
they were all 24 years old. <laughs> there, there is something very interesting. Genetics has, doesn't really seem to have found out yet. But then also then they stay at that age. So there's a kind of point mm, of adulthood mm. turning directly into middle age, but they're not really passing beyond that either. Mm. Is it meant to be sort of a bad thing that rather than having a silver spoon, he's only got a silver-plated spoon? He only got a silver-plated spoon, oh, yeah. Oh, gutted for you, mate. <laughs> We didn't even have a spoon. Yeah. We had to share it. But he tells the story of the Rye House plot, um, which which is where you got the beheaded William Russell, uh, who is in the fabulous mausoleum. He, The Encyclopedia Britannica refers to the Rye House plot as an alleged plot, which is really hedging their bets for something that happened in the 17th century, I think. <laughs> well, do you know what? Yeah, libel laws uh, in when that was put together. I don't think that passage in the Encyclopedia Britannica has actually been updated since 1814 so that would be some things people go things have changed you know what we have to change the chapter about how sawdust ultimately creates mice babies um, whereas yeah I think some things are unchanging and, and therefore left untampered with to be fair he did have his head sewn back on so perhaps it was an alleged plot maybe this is it supposedly a group of uh, nobles including William Russell of uh, Professor Yaffle heritage uh, well the ancestor of the cartoon bird mm. Professor Yaffle yeah yeah. He uh, he and others plotted that when Charles the Second was riding past Rye House, he was to be uh, executed. Uh, but that didn't happen. Um, How are they going to do it? The old wire, I... <laughs> the old cheese wire across. I don't know. I, do, I don't know what the plan was. Just uh, shove him. Give him a shove. Alleged plan was uh, mm. obviously. Um, and they they were found out, and he he was uh, he was beheaded, but his head was sewn back on, and now he head and all uh, are buried in the the tomb is meant to be one of the, one of the finest in England. It's very. I, I've never actually been into the chapel. It's, it's opened very rarely. You can get into the. Or you used to be able to get into the main church. There's that sheet of flames that comes up every time you try and go in as well. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need the gold key, James. <laughs> Have you not found the gold key yet? But yeah, it's very beautiful. So it's and and I always used to excite me as a child to think that there was someone beheaded who would then I mean I presume now sewn back on that won't have made any difference because <laughs> I don't what, whatever know. was you you and your rationalism you and your pessimistic <laughs> scepticism have a dream for once Robin well I don't I don't know what the medical world was at the time I don't think it would have cured it yeah is it called reheading by the way <laughs> recapitation I think oh, is, recapitation. The, is the technical term. <laughs> And Cheney's Manor is supposedly haunted, but and this shocked me. I can't find a single corroborated account of the haunting there. What? One tour guide has a long passage about the house and ends by saying that the attic is all one open floor full of ghosts. <laughs> and that's all the information. It just... <laughs> It's just full of but ghosts. But it, it's known for having some of the laziest mm. ghosts. That's the thing. <laughs> what used to draw people there was its incredible laziness. Not very far away from you is Grimm's Ditch, mm. also known as Grimm's Dyke, also known as Graham's Dyke. Not as good. <laughs> much, much worse a name. Mm. And there are a lot of Grimm's Dykes. James, you told me there's a Grimm's Ditch near you. Yeah, there's one. We've got a little bit of something called Grimm's Ditch. It seems that's something that cropped up all around the country. Yeah. According to the book Records of Buckinghamshire, uh, 1858, which I, I daren't ask mm. Robin if he's read, because he probably has. I haven't. I'm quite excited by this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a, a catalogue of the landscape and uh, antiquities of, uh, of Buckinghamshire. Grimm's Dyke, it's called both Ditch and Dyke, and of course it is both. It's a ditch and then it's a dyke, depending on which side you're approaching it from. Mm. And uh, it's still there, it's not that deep, but it goes on for quite a long way. And mm. um, according to the book in 1858, even at that time, the country folk of the region believed it to stretch all the way around the world, which I thought seemed a little bit fanciful. But then thinking about how flat earthers still exist now, I suppose it is plausible that you could find one person in Buckinghamshire mm. who thought that... You just couldn't be bothered to go all the way along. You just couldn't be bothered to check if anything was on the <laughs> other side of the time. Probably, probably around the world or something. I'm going back to bed. The records of Buckinghamshire says that um, Graham's, Graham's or Grimm's Dyke is believed to have been executed by Lollius Urbicus. Lollius? Yes, he was one of the most amusing Roman generals, uh, son of <laughs> Rophilius Urbicus and Lamauius Urbicus. We all remember them. There was their annoying cousin, IIRC. <laughs> Apart from Lollicus, the other person who is credited with having built it, it was, is, of course, the magician Guy de Gravard, 
or Guy de Gravard of Tring. Oh, yeah. And I have to say, just over the border in Hertfordshire, there's some fantastic names. We've got Gubblecoat, mm. Bull Beggar's Lane. I know that very, very well. <laughs> a bull beggar is uh, a, a, one of the oldest names for a type of fairy. Uh, Watford. Oh, yeah. Amazing names. Uh, the, the book records that they believed the Great Dyke was more than a match for the sea, and like the sea serpent, drags its length along beneath the surface. And uh, the name Grimm's Dyke, it might have been named after a Graham, mm. but the connection made by this book is the, apparently, uh, Saxon word for magician, Grimmer, which also sometimes means devil. The writer says, we may fairly interpret Grimm's Dyke as... Mm. The Ditch of the Wizard. Mm. And from this point on, almost basically everything about it sounds like a prog rock album. <laughs> it's a weird or wizard spot, and upon its bank nothing of good omen happens. Uh, I've been told in perfect good faith by one who dwelt near it that on Grimsdyke the unhappy Jane Shaw perished, being starved to death by King Richard's order. Now, uh, Jane Shaw was the mistress of Edward IV, who fell out of favour. And you know that thing in Game of Thrones where one of the ladies had to like, walk around naked? I haven't seen it. Do you know the, the scene I mean? I've not seen it. I've not seen it. Are, are we the three people who haven't seen Game of Thrones? Jane Shaw was the inspiration for, I think, Cersei Lannister. Apologies, listeners. Being humiliated, she was forced to walk the streets of London wearing only a shift or something like that. And the story is people were forbidden to help her and her baker, who gave her a, a penny loaf or a halfpenny loaf, was was executed for having given her that loaf upon Grimm's Dyke, although I've checked, and that happens in a play called The Tragedy of Jane Shaw by Nicholas Rowe, 1714, and not in what we would usually think of as reality. I was thinking that, because Graham's Dyke is kind of the antithesis, because sometimes finding out that Grimm's Dyke might be Graham's Dyke is the opposite of Bun Hill. Because Bunhill, you go, oh, Bunhill, what a fun name, Bunhill, <laughs> Bunhill. Oh, oh, it's Bonehill. Oh, it's the Hill of Bones oh. for the destitute and lost. All these mixed messages. <laughs> mm. So, now to the scores. Yes. Are you ready to score this? I was supposed to use the word ramshackle, but it's negative. <laughs> this uh, somewhat mm. meandering episode of Lawmen. Mm. Okay, our first category is... Naming. Naming. Okay. What do you think of the names? Well, I love Grimm's Ditch. Graham's Ditch. But I less like Graham's Ditch. Okay, but... I like the devil... It's also the devil's ditch, or the devil's dyke as well. Yes. But I don't think the devil's ever been called Graham. The silliest <laughs> name I heard for the devil was Roger recently. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Roger's Storms or something. Um, tornadoes were called something like Roger Storms because you weren't really... You didn't really want to say the devil's name. So you said Roger instead. So they called him Roger. I don't think he's ever been called Graham, though. Well, there used to be a serial called um, Golden Lucifers. <laughs> and then they changed it, so I think there was... I prefer Choco Beelzebub's. We've got the village of Tring. Come on. Mm. Gubblecoat, Bull Beggar's Lane, Guy de Gravard, mm. the alchemist. His mate... I think his mate's John Bond as well. <laughs> he had a sidekick called John Bond. And they vanished a house which um, sometimes appears as a ghost. Oh. Our first ghost house of the podcast. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I, it's strong on naming. And we, of course, we've got every every British actor from the 1970s. Every male British actor from the 1970s, because they didn't, they didn't have women in films in those days. It, there would usually be one, but it, that, was, <laughs> that was considered the limit. That's what the posters used to say. They used to say, Vincent Price, Nicky Henson, a woman. <laughs> that was it. That was... I'm going to go with... A four. A four out of five? Because there's a, there's a, I like Grimm's Ditch. It's got a good feel to it. Nice. Okay, I'll pop that in the ledger. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, inscribe Thank that um, in on the vellum. Mm -hmm. The second category mm -hmm. that we're pitching towards you is Supernatural. Ooh. A ditch, James. Explain that. That might have been made by a wizard or Graham. I'm going to go three. I'm going to go three because we've basically got... What? We've got a devil or wizard called Graham... And there was an attic full of ghosts. So you're going to get just a three as a job lot for your attic full of ghosts. Your open plan ghost house. There's also, let's not forget, the beheaded recapitated and that, that haunting possibility. That sounds like pure science oh, okay, to me. Fair enough. <laughs> so three, that is uh, completely unreasonable. But uh, we haven't time to complain. So, um, <laughs> because uh, for the sake of the listener, we're a little over time. Next category yep. is... The postgate always rings twice. <laughs> Which is... A.K.A. 70s oddities and miscellanea. Well... Now, come on, James. I mean, if I could give you 70 out of 5, it would definitely <laughs> be the score. I, I think... Mean, this reminds me very much of the Iron Cloak 
from 1976 with uh, Steve mm. Trousers. <laughs> Have you seen that? Uh, no. It's a classic. Uh, Steve Trousers, uh, John Trousers, no relation, mm. and a woman. <laughs> Oh, Woman Out of the Vincent Price films. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, you have seen it, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be five. It's got to be full marks. Fantastic. It's a whiz-bang. And our final category, Recapitation. Oh, yes. How many times did it happen? Oh, come on, James. It happened once. No, I, yeah, no. He was fully recapitated. I'll give you a four, uh, but it- I'll take that little extra one. And I'm going to screw it back on. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's how they did it. Like a like a bottle of matey. <laughs> uh, for American listeners, uh, Google it. For American listeners, you're on your own. Yeah, soz. Robin Ince, thank you so much for being a deputy law person. Mm. It's been wonderful to have you on the pod. We've wanted this for such a long time yes. and COVID got in the way. And now regretting it for even longer afterwards, which I think is good. Absolute nightmare come yeah. the edit, but um, recording it was a delight. Editing it. Oh, if you want to do, look, if you want me to, I, I can come back. I can script everything I've said. I can, I'm sure we can work an in and out that will work. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, this has been wonderful. I don't think we have time for you to plug everything you're up to, but I understand that you've just finished writing a book. Is there anything you'd like to plug to the uh, flaming nerds who listen to our podcast yeah, that's fine I mean if, if they want to go to cosmicshambles.com we do, I've had a lot of nice times doing a new series called Tips for Existence and I've got an episode with Neil Gaiman uh, which is coming up which is a lot of fun and uh, Tim Minchin and Andrean Ooh. and Francesca Stavrokopoulou who if you've not had on this you should who's a great atheist bible scholar from the Ooh. University of Exeter I haven't even read the atheist bible do you know what it's not that much shorter it turns out <laughs> <laughs> the footnotes are kind of make it a lot clearer um, and also I've just, I do a series now called Uncanny Hour, which is me talking oh, to people yes. like uh, Stuart Lee and 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 Alan Moore and uh, and various others uh, about some of my favourite kind of odd films. I mean, I suppose the folklore one that just done uh, is about Derek Jarman's Jubilee, which of course has John D and Queen Elizabeth I coming mm. into mm. the kind of dystopian uh, vision of of a, of a collapsed London, but also things like Deathline and John Carpenter movies. So that they're all over at CosmicShambles.com. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Keen-eared listeners might have noticed a couple of references to this episode being somewhat freewheeling, but I think you can't really tell in the edit. No, I think it's like Robin didn't really know how uh, ramshackle we normally are, and if anything, (laughs) he brought a slickness and cohesion of thought that has never been there. That said, our Patreons are in for a treat because we're going to upload a mega chunkulous extra from the outtakes of this recording. I think it's going to be longer than the episode. So if you want to hear all that, it's patreon.com forward slash lawmenpod. We will have to cut the bits where I've landed a Saturday night TV host. I think of folkloric films, um, the film The Shout... Uh, based on a short story by Robert Graves with Alan Bates and uh, Susanna York and John Hurt. Have you ever seen that? Mm-mm. No. That's a really great, for, for a folklore, it's about Alan Bates is someone who is in, uh, he's in an asylum and uh, he, uh, his thing is he has learnt, I think it's in Australia, with um, one of the Aboriginal tribes that he spent time with, a shout that is so terrifying and so powerful, it will destroy your enemy. Oh, well, that Whoa. that sounds annoying. It is. It's a, yeah. Just when you think we've got over the whistling, yeah, even we worse. Just have to take out two of his front teeth. <laughs> turned out he can't whistle anymore. <laughs> oh, he can shout, can he? Mm. You didn't mention his other superpower. <laughs> wow. And then even at night, he's got the snore <laughs> to drive people to insanity. What a trilogy of films. <laughs> Well, the great thing is those second two haven't been made, so I think we we can. <laughs> I think it's, it's it's a three-way on this, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. This is copyrighted now by being on the podcast. Yep, yep. We so just have to any... print the podcast out and post it to ourselves, and then yep, 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 yep. in comes the money. Yep.